it was in 1994 that I was given a writing assignment. Somebody wanted to know about the debate on abortion. They said one side says that it's killing. Another side says that it's a medical procedure. Is there a way of finding out how the people who do abortions, the doctors and nurses, respond to it? Do they respond like so, uh, someone who's engaged in killing, or do they respond like someone who's simply doing uh, medical care? So I thought, okay, well, the first way to go at that question is how on earth do people respond to their own acts of killing? And I said, well, of course, that's uh, what we used to call battle fatigue. And now we call it uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I knew that much. So I thought, well, well, we'll look into that. And when I looked into it, lo and behold, people were not thinking in terms of battle fatigue as being caused by killing, even in combat veterans. They're thinking, okay, you were being shot at. That traumatized you. You saw your buddy getting shot. That traumatized you. You shot somebody that wasn't on the agenda. And I thought, okay, I'm taking a peace movement person's view of this, aren't I? And in fact, I'll tell you, over the years, I have found that I have yet to find a person in the peace movement to whom it doesn't make perfect sense to say that, of course, the act of killing would be traumatic. But it's not common in the literature. I mean, since post-traumatic stress disorder was defined as a psychiatric condition uh, in the 1980s after the uh, war in Vietnam and because of the American war in Vietnam and the, the veterans thereof, there's been an explosion. I mean, there are thousands of articles and books written about post-traumatic stress disorder. It has been applied to refugees, concentration camp uh, survivors, uh, crime victims, hurricane victims. We will, of course, be getting a, a large amount uh, from the hurricane in Katrina. But perpetrators simply were just mainly not there. Now, I kept thinking, I, I, I mean, I went to get my PhD in order to study this. And I kept thinking, oh, I just haven't figured out the right way to word this. I, I ha there's a mother load somewhere, and I just haven't found it. Well, I did find a handful of articles where they use the commission of atrocities. And they use the word atrocities, uh, which is rather unusual in scholarly nomenclature. Uh, and they did find, yes, that that has to do with uh, getting post-trauma symptoms. Uh, but they weren't thinking in terms of the ordinary militarily justified uh, kind of killing. If you hadn't done it, you'd have been shot yourself kind of thing. So, it, and it was only a handful of articles anyway. Now, I went ahead and expanded it to people who carry out executions, Nazis, uh, criminal homicide, and police who shoot in the line of duty. Now, there is where I found my mother load. There, it's the exception that proves the rule. Plenty of articles uh, said that shooting was more traumatic to the police officer than being shot at was. But you see, it's not the police officer's fault. It's the fault of the person who required the police officer to do the shooting. And if they feel bad about it, then all the more heroic that they are, unlike the soldier who is not expected to feel bad. So I need to start, of course, with a, a basic explanation of what post-traumatic stress disorder is. There's an American definition and an international definition, which are almost the same, but um, uh, the, the American definition has an A1, A2, B3 <laughs> set up, and the International Health Organization has one that's um, 
the World Health Organization has one that is um, more narrative. It's characterized by a lot of jumpiness. You can be very startled at uh, noises, and you get uh, you can have a, a reaction with increased heartbeat and so forth to anything that reminds you of the trauma. There is uh, avoidance of any reminders of the trauma, which is hardly surprising. There are uh, intrusive thoughts that you cannot get rid of, nightmares, and flashbacks. Uh, those are the main things. There are, there are others as well. And the uh, Psychiatric Association says that uh, you have to have uh, X number in order to get an actual diagnosis. I myself do not care about a diagnosis. Um, I'm not a clinical uh, psychologist, and if I'm not interested in whether or not this specific individual can get compensation or, or whatever, which is the reason that they have for a specific diagnosis. I'm interested if, if anybody has symptoms at all. And I have found it's very common when I bring this up with combat veterans that they will say something to me like, yeah, it always sticks with you which is their way of wording the intrusive imagery. Now, I did a study on this, and this is really the only uh, large-scale study that's been done on this particular point. The United States government did a study of the veterans in Vietnam. So I had a database of 1,638 stratified random samples. If you look at the book uh, that was done on this National Vietnam Veterans Readjustment Study, you will find nothing on the question of killing as a trauma. It just plain is not there. Search the index far and wide. It did not occur to the authors. But fortunately, the question was there. Did you kill or think that you killed anyone in Vietnam, yes or no? Now, you see already how very poorly the question is asked. I have no way of distinguishing somebody who thought there was a rustling in the bushes and maybe they got a sniper, as opposed to somebody who went on a rampage and killed 100 women and children. The, the, the distinction is not there. Although, there was a later distinction uh, of whether people were exposed to the killing of women and children, old people, uh, prisoners, and so forth. And then they divided those into those that were directly involved and those that only saw. Well, of course, that was perfect for what I wanted to find out because uh, just yes or no, if somebody's doing paperwork in Saigon, then it's hardly surprising that they have no um, trauma, <laughs> you know. And, um, and I had found in what little discussion there was in the scholarly literature that it seemed that not only people could get PTSD from killing, but that it was more severe. So I wanted to test that first thing. Now, you don't need to worry about what these numbers mean because it's a scale that, the, I mean, number, higher numbers mean more and lower numbers mean yes, I mean less. Higher numbers mean more and lower numbers mean yet less. Those who said yes on killing were at 93.4, no on killing, 71.9. The significant value of that, which is what the P means, it is highly significant. That is to say, it's not due to chance. Hey, now, could you get to that higher thing? Sure. Okay. And uh, now the Cohen's D is a measure of the size of the difference. It's a fancy way of saying that. You can see it's almost one. That's huge. That's a huge difference. But then, like I said, uh, do we know if the no on killing were subjected to any traumas at all, merely because they were in Vietnam? So here we have um, the directly involved in 
uh, killing on civilians and so forth, and the only saw, and you can see there the difference is between 105 and 79. So people who were definitely exposed to a trauma nevertheless had lower PTSD scores than those that were directly involved in causing it. You'll also notice that the yes on killing is higher than those that only saw. The yes on killing includes those who might have been in the militarily justified uh, version. Now, the next problem is, okay, that's all very well, but supposing it's nothing more than that the people who killed were in heavy combat, and people who didn't kill were in lighter combat. And so, I mean, we already know that heavier combat means more PTSD symptoms because that's how we know that PTSD is caused by the trauma. The more trauma, the more PTSD. If that weren't so, maybe it's being caused by something else. So let's take out the, the uh, battle intensity. And you will see here that as you go from almost none, light, moderate, heavy, the scores go up in each column. That's as to be expected. There would be something wrong with the data if it weren't that way. If you leave out the almost none, because, you know, how many people killed when there was almost no battle? The answer is six. That, that messes up the statistics. Just go from the, uh, no, those who answered no on killing to those, look at the heavy, 80.3. Light combat for those that killed, 85.5. So those who did kill in light combat had heavier PTSD than those who did not kill in heavy combat. And various other ways of uh, testing it also showed that killing does seem to be a heavier stressor than other stressors for, uh, than be, killing is a heavier stressor than merely being a victim. Now, can I say that with firm conviction? Of course not. The study wasn't set up to qu answer that question. They are going to be redoing it. I have given them a memo saying, please, please ask these questions. And they've said they will, but you know how that goes. Now, I also did what's called a discriminant function analysis, which is a fancy way of saying that I was looking at the pattern differences. And those that answered yes on killing were over and over again in all different kinds of ways of measuring it, especially high on the violent outburst, you know, temper, rage problems, and on the intrusive symptoms, which are the thoughts they can't get rid of, the nightmares, and the uh, flashbacks. Uh, pause and consider what both of those do to the possibility of street crime and domestic violence once they get back home. Um, th with the flashbacks, there, there have even been cases where they're in the middle of a bar fight and they, they, just, they just see the other person as the enemy soldier because of the flashback. Um, then when we have cases like you might recall uh, in the recent Iraq war where there were some wives that were killed very soon after soldiers came back, um, this, this is a, a problem waiting to happen. They're also high on hyperarousal, alienation, survival guilt, and a sense of disintegration. Um, the survivor guilt was uh, covered in the, the third edition of the manual, but not in the fourth revised. I mean, it's been dropped from the definition. Note that I don't have anything about justified guilt. That's because it wasn't in there. I, I was not able to figure out how that worked in. Notice also that there's a, a lack of suicidality, but I think that that's not because they were lower in suicide, but precisely because 
having suicidal thoughts is one of the symptoms where the most extreme form pulls you out of the database completely. The, the sense of disintegration is also not a common PTSD symptom, but I would think it would be common as a symptom of post-killing uh, traumatic reactions, and there needs to be a lot more study on that. Uh, now, on no on killing, notice what comes up high. Concentration problems and memory problems. Why? Darned if I know. This needs more studying. It was, uh, it was a surprise. Did you define hyperarousal? I didn't, I don't hyperarousal know. is when you're just jumpy at small oh, noises. Okay. That's also sense of disintegration. Sense of disintegration were things like your body's falling apart, your world is falling apart, uh, panic attacks and things like that. Um, it was actually, there was no sense of disintegration in the data. I did a factor analysis where a whole bunch of those things went into one factor, and that's what I labeled it. And this is also not uh, a PTSD symptom, but it won't surprise anybody to know that substance abuse is uh, related. And as you can see, uh, the, those who uh, said yes on killing had more than those who said no. Now, ex opioid is um, heroin heroin, um, morphine, and um, what's the other one? Cocaine. Um, okay, this is the, the statistical study. And here I am doing my dissertation and I'm getting all excited because by golly is my hypothesis being confirmed something fierce. And my mother said to me, Rachel, those numbers mean people are suffering. And of course, that brought me back down to reality. <laughs> well, that's what we have them for. And um, that, that is what we do need to remember. But as I said, I looked at other groups too. I looked at um, people who carried out executions and I looked at uh, Nazis and criminal homicide and police officers and it really is something that seems to be uh, across the board. But this is the only statistical study. Everything else it could be, you know, I found the three people that had it. Um, you, can't, you can't really say with firm conviction, but there is a lot of case studies that suggest at the very least that it's not a wild goose chase to do the, um, the studies on it, and if anybody wants to have the literature review started for them, I have them in the chapters of this book, The Perpetration Induced Traumatic Stress, Psychological Consequences of Killing, that Prager put out. Now, I'm also going to give you some poetry here that uh, gives expressions because, um, you know, as I said, you, you, um, you don't draw conclusions from the fact that one person wrote a poem, but it does give texture to the experience, give you some idea of what the experience was like. This one is written by a, a British soldier from the First World War. They ask me where I've been and what I've done and seen, but what can I reply who know it wasn't I, but someone just like me who went across the sea and with my head and hands killed men in foreign lands, though I must bear the blame because he bore my name. The prime example of the sense of alienation.
this is the uh, intrusive imagery, an excerpt from Confession by an American veteran of Vietnam, Morton Marcus. How do I say that I'm a murderer? My victims are inside me. Now they are murderers. The bloody wafer fountains in my stomach. They wash their hands in it before they invade my mouth with a bad taste. They face me, fire chewing their hair. These are the ones I have allowed to move inside me, but they didn't wait for my invitation. And finally, I started off saying, what about the abortion issue? And the answer, like so many others of them, is enough study. But um, there have been a couple of large studies by which I mean one of them had 150 people in them. Well, I mean, it's not like the, the, the one that I did here, but it is something and all of the studies that have been done by people who are not abortion staff and were done on a, a good number of abortion staff have picked up some uh, evidence of combat fatigue or, or the symptoms were listed out. All of the studies, both of them, okay? There's been two, that's it. I've been unable to find any more. But this does give you some of the texture this is a nurse who, and if you read the article in Harper Magazine, it's quite clear that she is uh, very definitely pro-choice, remains so. Um, she says, I have fetus dreams. We all do here. Dreams of abortions one after the other, of buckets of blood splashed on the walls, trees full of crawling fetuses. I dreamed that two men grabbed me and began to drag me away. Let's do an abortion, they said with a sickening leer. And I began to scream, plunged into a vision of sucking, scraping pain. Now, one of the things um, that you need to uh, notice about this is the, the, the dream is a little different from other trauma dreams because trauma of victim dreams tend to be eidetic, which is a way of saying they're like videotapes in the head. They're replaying the trauma. This one is, is more dreamlike, and we look at, at what veterans uh, say about their dreams and all, we find different motifs. The veterans particularly are more likely to be killed by the person they killed, or to have the, the Vietnamese peasants say coming and accusing them in English or asking why they did it. These kinds of motifs are much more common in the intrusive dreams, at least according to what I've been able to find in the literature. There hasn't been a full-fledged study of this yet. Note also that she, she has it happening to her, and we have something that's, uh, it's not just the babies, it's also the women. Uh, that's something like a rape scenario. What? That's what it read like. Yes. Uh, and I, I think there are reasons for that. But you know, this goes into the question, well, what about, uh, what about if it's torture rather than killing? Of course, there are a lot of police that have been expected to do that in various places around the world. What if it's domestic violence? Um, what if the person isn't actually killed? What if the person asks to be killed, as in a euthanasia case? Well. In all those cases, there is so little evidence that I just took them all together and put them in Chapter 7 under miscellaneous. So there is an awful lot more study that needs to be done here, but one of the main things that I'm wanting to do with this is to get the concept across so that people will study it and we will find out more. Now, there has been more of an interest in it after the war in Iraq. The media has taken quite an interest. Uh, I, I actually did three uh, uh, interviews for documentaries on this. One of them was for The Frontline that aired last March, and if you saw that, you would see that I wasn't on it. And if you saw the whole thing, that wouldn't surprise you terribly when you saw that the basic thesis was, oh, we need people to be able to kill, therefore we need to figure out how to make it not so hard on them. 
I, I mean, I was, I was upset at first when I uh, found that they had cut me out. But after the program, my mother again <laughs> looked at it and said, Rachel, it is just as well, <laughs> given the approach they were taking. But the thing is, at least they were paying attention to it. And, and they haven't done that before. So the more progress we make on this, uh, the better, the more we can understand what's really going on. A number of things from my CBT experience are, are coming through my head, um, CBT and otherwise. First was the memory of uh, the experience of Teresa Ortiz as a captive um, with torturers in Guatemala. violence against another innocent person as a part of her being tortured. Well, it is true. It is also true. I, I, I don't know the difference between draftees and people who enlisted. I don't know the difference between um, people who did it in a rage and people who did it because their officer commanded them. I don't know the difference between people who did it by accident or did it with great premeditation. I don't even know the difference between people who bombed from an airplane as opposed to seeing it close up. What does it do to not even be able to see it? And the answer is, we have to study it yet. Uh, part of the object of torture is you can only get so far until the object, the person that you're torturing, makes decisions that they understand to be their decisions. Um, I think that and the, the other experience mm -hmm. with CBT that I think of in Chiapas, uh, a paramilitary tactic was rather than committing the violence directly against the people that they wanted to change, they forced them to come along and burn the houses of uh, they, yeah, it would indicate that it's, obviously it's, it's going to bring them into that guilt and all those things of having committed trauma. Um, it's also going to sort of make them make the choice. Mm -hmm. And how much was it true that the torturers themselves had been subjected to those kinds of choices previously? This is the one place uh, I have found that if I bring in the idea that the torturers are being traumatized by the torture, a lot of the advocates for the torture victims' rights get angry at me because post-traumatic stress disorder is their people's thing. And if I say that the torturers are getting it from the torture, that might suggest that the torturers are also people. And just as the uh, military uh, reaction is, okay, how do we figure out how to get the soldiers to go ahead and kill, uh, there's, there are all different kinds of reactions. And one reaction I got once was a fellow who said, oh, the Nazis got nightmares from what they were doing. Good. You, you can be very vindictive about it. They weren't uh, properly tried in court. You couldn't try them all in court, but by golly, they still suffered. And, you know, people will take, and then you remember the case of Senator uh, Kerry, Robert Kerry, and it was a big thing in the news, and I was sitting there watching the news saying, I know what's going on. He's expressing symptoms of PTSD. Now, it's not PTSD. D, because there was no disorder. Obviously, the man was a United States senator and a university president at the time. He was, uh, he was not dysfunctional. Nevertheless, I could see that there were post-trauma symptoms. Now, in the Progressive magazine, their immediate reaction was, what, we're supposed to feel sorry for this guy? The, the Vietnamese uh, uh, innocents were dead for all these years. That was the same reaction that John Leo had. John Leo uh, is a columnist that's well known for being conservative, and his attitude was what? We're supposed to feel bad because he feels bad? Doesn't he, you know, somehow morality has something to do with how bad you feel about it? So there was an utter lack of sympathy for him on this point. 
And indeed, I would imagine there would be a lot more people who would be sympathetic towards the unemployed draftee than towards the successful U.S. Senator. But of course, what I'm doing here is the science of it. What we conclude from the science of it is going to come from other things that we know. What would your findings point to in terms of uh, treatment or healing for perpetrators? This is a very tough question for me because of my expertise, and I've been quoted in uh, uh, the New Yorker and various uh, media. People who are loved ones of uh, folks coming back from Iraq have written me and said, what do I do? And I have to say, I don't know, but listen. We do know that one technique that works for victims of trauma is terrible for perpetrators, and that is the flooding technique. It's called prolonged exposure. You, you keep subjecting yourself to reminders of the trauma with the idea that you will then desensitize yourself to it. There are some people for whom that works, there are others for whom it does not work, and perpetrators are one of the groups for whom it does not work. Now, what about the eye movement desensitization and uh, readjustment technique? I don't know, hasn't been tested. What about the pharmaceuticals? Should they be the same or different? I don't know. People have not been paying attention to the distinction. And if there's a distinction in one kind of therapy, it stands to reason there could easily be a distinction in another kind of therapy. Now, what people who have done therapy with these kinds of people say is that the main thing that seems to be helpful is what's traditionally known to be helpful, which is forgiveness, atonement, bearing witness a lot of the, the traditional religious things seem to be what's most helpful. But there's never been a study, no, I mean that may just be the particular people that came to them for all they know. Um, right now that's the best we can do and the best I can do for telling the people who ask me about their loved ones is listen to them let it be clear to them that if they wish to express what happened, you're not going to shut them up. You'll listen. And there's reason to think, particularly with the work of, of Penna Baker and a lot of the work that there's been on expression, that it may be that one of the reasons that it's more severe is that people who perpetrate are less likely to be able to express because other people don't want to hear it. In CBT, we find we're beginning to find ourselves impacted by these kinds of stresses as well. Not because we commit the act or because we've been I mean, somebody who did commit the act, but because of the stress or the uh, CPT being Christian peacemaker teens. Um, it, this is what is called secondary traumatization. It was especially common, for instance, on the uh, people doing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission work in South Africa. And it's common among therapists. And I think one of the reasons that therapists don't talk a whole lot about their clients that need help because they killed is because the therapists don't want to hear about it. It's more traumatizing to them as well than if soldiers have ever killed. There's various ways of studying this and you know even when you're, you're in the midst of battle and we're not talking about people who were fleeing battle because they were still carrying messages and helping their buddies who were injured and everything it has been remarkable, and the military knows this, how few people have killed. One of the things they did is they said, uh, gee, there don't seem to be too many uh, bullseye targets flying around <coughs> in battle, so what we need to do is start operant conditioning. And B.F. Skinner looked at this and said, boy, they've got operant conditioning down. You have a human-shaped target that actually goes down when you hit it. And so 
I think that one of the reasons that post-traumatic stress disorder was so much higher after Vietnam uh, than it was uh, in previous wars is because they had them trained to kill better, but uh, the, that training did not protect them from the post-trauma symptoms. It probably made them worse. Now, of course, there's no way to run a control experiment on that to say whether that hypothesis is true. But it, it does seem that it was after the war in Vietnam that PTSD was so bad that it, it did finally get defined. And it does seem to be a higher proportion of those veterans, World War II veterans, for instance. Mm -hmm. In the first Iraqi war adventure in the early 90s, mm -hmm. and the ones that actually saw combat, 21.5% of them perpetrated domestic violence requiring law enforcement intervention. It's a huge number of domestic violence numbers. Yes. Mm -hmm. or psychological problems before. That is something that has occurred to people. Did the, uh, the veterans have previous problems? For instance, if they were abused as children, it would stand to reason they'd be more likely to get post-traumatic stress disorder from combat because, like I said, the more trauma, I mean, it does accumulate. It builds up. And uh, so while they weren't looking at perpetration-induced traumatic stress specifically, they did do studies of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder with these previous things. And um, basically, it looks like while child abuse is certainly going to make it worse, there's no reason to think that it was only the, those that were abused that, as children and therefore that it wasn't really the war that was traumatic. Uh, that's, and that's somebody else's study. Yes. They aren't disturbed by any other measure. You bring up an important point. The thrill of the kill. I mean, people go hunting on purpose because it gives them a thrill. There is a theory called uh, addiction to trauma. And it first came up with uh, domestic abuse victims that kept going back to the abuser. So the next question is, does that apply here? And you can find innumerable cases of people who found it highly enjoyable. Now, it is not merely that they are finding it enjoyable. It is a high. And they have said it is similar to the high of cocaine. Now, that's another reason for the use of the word opioid, because what is actually happening is that there are opioids naturally produced in the brain by trauma. Now, it actually makes sense in the design of things. You've got this zebra that's running away from a lion. The zebra is, of course, scared. The zebra has got to pay complete attention to getting away from the lion. So you get a stress reaction that has various things that make perfect sense in terms of getting away from that lion. And one of those is the opioid reaction. Why? Because it gets rid of the pain. And when you're trying to get away from that lion is no time to be feeling pain. Okay? So there is actually a biochemical explanation for this. And the thing that is important about there being a biochemical explanation is that we can in fact call it addiction. That's why a lot of the, the people are actually spoiling for bar fights when they come back home. But we can also say that it's still a trauma. The mere fact that they felt exhilaration at the time, which according to the psychiatric definition should keep it from being PTSD, they nevertheless get all the symptoms. They get them heavy. And 
when the bar fight is over and the sense of exhilaration is gone, they have withdrawal symptoms. They feel worse. So the ironic thing is that you can have a sense of exhilaration and, and still see that it is clearly defined as a trauma. And in fact, this addiction to trauma uh, idea may be where the concept of bloodthirsty comes from. And that is one thing that I so thoroughly want to have studied. Um, because of course, as you can see, I've been talking all through, one of the things we need to do is to heal people who've been through trauma, but another of the things we need to do is violence prevention in the first place. And one of the things that is happening here is that violence begets violence. This is one of the mechanisms whereby violence begets violence.